hopefully the audio is configured correctly. This is the sponsored by Demos Player on Twitch stream. Uh, this uh, game is, is um, a game that I, I don't think is going to be very fun. And um, I basically got paid like $10 in subscriber money to play this game, so um, yeah. So don't expect too much. But um, yeah, we're, we're selling out and playing this game, so let's go. I guess we'll keep the names on default. I've had a fair bit of practice doing this. I had a bit of be beginner's luck in the beginning, but um. My first try, I just kind of hit the space station on the first try. It wasn't that hard at all. But, um... Attention, interloper. Heed this recorded message. Sure. This drone vessel speaks with the voice and authority of the Urquan. Trespassing within Urquan space. This world, Earth, may not be approached for any reason. Nor will hostilities against our orbital platform be tolerated. In addition, your ship does not respond to standard hierarchy identification transmissions. And Therefore, deemed to be independent. This is not permissible. Only subservience shall be tolerated. This drone now needs to inform the Urquan of your transgressions. You are commanded to remain here and await the arrival of the Urquan. Disobedience will be punished. So is that little Bulbasaur down there? Is that like an Urquan? <laughs> In the recording? Come on, come on, come on. I think it is. Oh. Attention, unidentified space vessel. I am Starbase Commander Hayes of the Slave Planet Earth. Our hyperwave contact extremely weak. Situation critical. Energy cores exhausted. Scanners and deep radar are non-functional. We cannot identify your vessel. Are you the scheduled hierarchy resupply ship? Repeat. Are you the resupply vessel? Well, it's about damn time. In the field agreement, the Urquan promised that this station would be resupplied at least every five years. And it's been over eight since the If you had arrived a few weeks later, there wouldn't be anyone alive on this station. Never mind. Just begin your transfer of materials immediately, starting with the radioactives. <laughs> I don't know who you are or why you're here, but right now the only thing I'm worried about is saving the lives of 1,900 men and women aboard this starbase, and right now you're our only hope. I can't keep a transmitter on too much longer. We need the power for heat and air, so if you don't have any radioactives on board your vessel, please get some and bring them back here before it's too late. The fastest way to get radioactive in this system would be to land on Mercury and scour the surface for deposits of radioactive elements. But be careful. Mercury is a pretty inhospitable place. Watch out for earthquakes and those high temperature areas. Thanks, I'll make sure to mention this the next time I talk with our masters. I'm sure they will reward you. Loot the moon. Ooh. Wow. 
ครับโน้ตทัวริลอะไรอ๋อฮะฮะ What the fuck Can I do anything else beyond just driving around them as to have like weapons and stuff? Um, I don't remember. I take it these green have... are these gr these green things are are they resources or are they like dangerous? I guess there's only one way to find out. I think you can shoot. Oh, you can. Yeah. My camera is in the way. This is such a hacky solution. <laughs> okay, I'll do this. Now it looks more professional. I uncheck display capture. Um. Yeah, so you can read the text yourself. Um. The installation you just... must have been abandoned many years ago. But great care was. Great care has been taken to make it appear active. Life support systems are functioning, fusion generators are at full output, and robotic construction vehicles have been programmed to roam the lunar surface, uh, bulldozing moon dust into, into random piles. In addition, we have found the installation's hyperwave locked in transmit mode, endlessly playing the same alien recording. Although we cannot translate the message, our Xenotech Ensign. Uh, I can't read this. Ribby believes the message is some kind of alert or mayday broadcast. The base is filled with useful materials, materials and equipment, and we'll scavenge as much as we can and bring it aboard immediately. Oh shit, fuel 9? I spent fuel? Hey, do I spend fuel every time I accelerate? Oh, I'll bring up Stream Shack too, by the way. Let's do that real fast. Um, I... I believe you do. Spend fuel. So, uh, but it's not. It, is it based on like distance moved, or is it based on time spent holding down the accelerate button? I. I don't know. Really. I guess when you accelerate. I like it. Yeah, 
I don't remember because it's been such a long time. So moving on the uh, moving in hyperspace, uh, you, you don't just move for free once you have inertia. There you have to like actually hold down to move. Yeah, I mean that makes sense. I don't know. May maybe it's when you you lost fuel <laughs> when you launched here. I think. Yeah. You just killed ten, 10 of your crew. It was those. It wasn't me. It was those damn high temperature areas. <laughs> you want to know about those? Every time I launch a little, little meme. Mm -mm. Fuck me, dude. Mm -mm. What the fuck? Well, we have no shuttle now. I hope we got what we needed. Dude, Crap, there is the no start. skill involved. There is no skill involved in this shit. They, they appeared under me. Like, what the fuck? Your message was garble. Oof. Had very little power. Such railroading. As soon as our engineers can refit the energy cores, there, that's much better. Power ratings are climbing. Life support is coming back into the green. Deep radar systems and sensors are now online, and I can scan your vessel. What the hell kind of ship is that? Just who are you, Captain? Star Control Science Mission, huh? <laughs> Captain, I served as a Star Control Officer during the war aboard several cruisers in the Corward Front. And if there'd been any scientific mission to Vela, I would have heard about it. Hmm. You know, come to think of it, there were some rumors that Corridor 9, the Special Operations Division of Star Control, was directing some hush-hush operation near Andresynth Space. The Vela star system, yes, that would be the right direction. So, Captain, if you say it's true, how do you explain that huge alien starship you're flying? And why are you here? What do you want from us? Ah, fight the Iroquois. Win back our freedom. I remember having such thoughts myself once, long time ago. That was in the first years after the defeat, when it was still terrifying to look up and see the bloody glow of the pulsating slave shield overhead. Though day and night we gazed up at the impenetrable wall as though the sheer power of our hatred would pull it down. But over the years I spent so much of my time struggling, down on the surface, under the shield, and then later up here trying to keep the station alive, that I'd forgotten what it means to be free, to hate our Urquan masters. And now here you are in an alien ship of unknown power offering me your assistance to fight against the hierarchy again after all these years. Captain, your offer is intriguing. It's tempting to think that with your advanced precursor technology we can somehow crack the Earth's slave shield and reassemble the Alliance to attack the hierarchy. And this time, 
win the damn war. Consider the consequences if you should fail. The Urquan won't just punish us here on the station, they'll exact a gruesome retribution on the surface below as well. Before I commit this station to helping you attack the Urquan and accepting the risk of annihilation if we are defeated, I have to make sure that you and your ship have what it takes to oppose the hierarchy. I'll make you a deal. If you can eliminate the alien base on the moon and get rid of that threat at least, I will seriously consider your offer. You fought them, Captain? Oof. I hope you didn't suffer serious casualties. <laughs> I'll be darned. All these years we've been listening to their incoherent broadcast and we never even guessed. Captain, listen closely. Long range sensors show a ship closing on this station fast. Our computer identifies it as Ilrath, Avenger class. I think you've got a fight on your hands, Captain. Your best bet is to wait until you have point blank range. Captain, it's jamming our signal. By the fetid breath of the Dark Twin Kazan, a human and an alien starship. How fascinating. When I intercepted that Urquan drone and learned that an unidentified starship had approached Earth, I never expected to find such a remarkable vehicle in the hands of a human. Humans are prey animals, weak and helpless. But here is a human in an armored starship, and therefore in direct violation of the oath of fealty. I am sure our masters, the Orquan, will punish Earth most severely for this treachery when I present them with the twisted wreckage of your ship and your many charred corpses. Since you will soon be dead, I will gladly explain. <laughs> of course. We have spent many years gleefully preying on the Pekunk. They are a pitiful, easily killed species. And we would have continued in this divine worship of Dogar and Kazon, but we required additional crew members and repairs to our cloaking device. So we departed the Jiglas constellation and set course for home. But before we had reached our region of space, we detected the passage of a nearby vessel, the Erwan Drone. It informed us about you, so here we are. And now, you die! Control and shift. What a beautiful sight, Captain. I haven't seen an Avenger blown away like that since the battle in Draco. I guess you've shown that you can handle yourself in battle, Captain. So my last reservation about helping you has been dissolved. I will commit this station to helping free Earth and defeat the Urquan. We may get our atoms rearranged in the process, but by God, Captain, we're going to try. So the obvious first step is to get the precursor equipment and software over here so that we can make it work with our ship repair fabricators. But then what, Captain? Well, if you feel it's necessary, Captain, I understand. <laughs> By the way, Captain, I think we need a name for this new alliance we're going to forge. And since it was your idea, it's only fair that you get the honor of naming it. So, what will it be? Uh, well, you're the one with the big starship. So be it. Now, Captain, I expect the configuration process for the Starbase to take at least two weeks, so let's get to work.
I have good news to report, Captain. We have successfully integrated the precursor technology from your ship into our fabricator system, and as you can see, we've already begun minor repairs on your ship, patching up some of the micrometeorite holes. We noticed that your ship does not have an emergency warp escape unit, so our engineers rigged up some for you and each of your escorts. Now, you should be able to escape from a bad situation with the touch of a button. But there is a cost, however. The unit gulps up five fuel units each time your precursor ship uses it. Also, we now have a limited capacity to make modifications to your ship, to refine starship fuel, to build additional combat ships, and to train new members of your crew for the flagship and any ships you acquire for your fleet. Captain, I know you're eager to get to work, so I'll be brief. If you have any questions how this star base works, what resources we need, or just some background information on the galaxy, don't hesitate to ask. Certainly, Captain. What do you need to know? <laughs> the biggest question I have is where did you get this where did you get this sound system and soundtrack? <laughs> we can modify your precursor ship, build additional combat vessels and supply you with crew yeah, yeah. and crew. Yeah, and then like the the beats. <laughs> Designed to service hierarchy ships. Fortunately, your flagship uses the same stabilized antimatter technology as hierarchy vessels and will be able to synthesize what you need. However, due to the size of your ship, we'll have to produce vast quantities of fuel, which will be a substantial drain on our resources. Our engineers and precursor specialists agree with the scientists from your world that your starship was designed to be a workhorse vehicle, which can be easily reconfigured for different missions by adding or swapping self-contained equipment packs, which we call modules. The modules we can build right now are thruster units, which make your ship move faster, attitude jets, which allow you to rotate the ship more quickly, Ooh. crew pods, which provide life support facilities for up to 50 additional crew members, storage bays, which increase your ship's cargo capacity for mineral resources, fuel tanks, which hold an additional 50 units of fuel, dynamos, which feed energy into your combat energy batteries, improving your weapon's rate of fire, and last but not least, ion bolt guns, combat weaponry, the exact function of which depends on its location aboard the ship. When put in the first or front module slot, it fires a single shot forward. When put in the second slot, it fires two shots, spread to the left, and right of center. When put in the third slot, it fires two shots directly left and right. And when put in the last or rear slot, it fires a single shot straight backwards. Our shipyard facilities are sophisticated and fully automated, permitting a handful of starbase personnel to do the same job as 500 vac suited construction workers. However, the only designs that we had in our computers were incomplete hierarchy ship designs. Things looked grim until one of the officers came forward with an amazing story. Even though the Urquan destroyed every Earthling cruiser in the fleet nearly 20 years ago, one of my maintenance engineers was a Starship production assistant at the Detroit shipyard. Detroit? When Earth was conquered, <laughs> she was ordered to destroy all ship construction databases. But she secretly made copies of the blueprint disk and then kept them with her ever since. These disks contain all the data we need to build as many Earthling cruisers as you want, provided you, Captain, can supply the large amounts of mineral resources required to build those vessels. In theory, Captain, we could build alien starships here if we had designs for them. However, it's a well-known fact that alien vessels just can't be flown in combat without native starship captains at the helm. We have almost 2,000 highly motivated, skilled professionals aboard this starbase, and every single one of them wants a berth aboard your starship. However, each hand we lose to your ship means less manpower here at the starbase, and this is reflected in the crew RU cost. As long as you don't lose too many crew members to combat or planet exploration, the RU cost will remain static. But we have only so many warm bodies on this starbase, and if your needs for crew grow beyond a certain point, the cost could increase dramatically. Ooh. As you know, Captain, we've committed the entire output of this station to building your flagship and your battle fleet into the strongest force possible. However, our resources are very limited, and we feel you must decide how we are to spend our effort and material. To aid you in making these decisions, we have implemented a resource allocation scheme. 
We provide you with a numerical assessment of the station's resources and ascribe a cost to each task we can perform and each device we can build. It's up to you to decide how you're going to spend your resource unit, or RU as we call them. To acquire more RU, you must bring resources back to the Starbase. These resources can be either in the form of mineral ores gathered from planet surfaces or already refined metals and other valuable materials from the wreckage of enemy starships. The most straightforward way you can accumulate resource units is to bring mineral ores back to this star base. There are probably enough resources in just the nearby dozen stars to build your ship into a powerful battleship or to create a strong task force of combat vessels. I would also recommend that you build several additional storage bays. When gathering minerals, focus on cleaning out one star system at a time. This way you minimize the cost of travel through hyperspace. While I respect your search for abstract knowledge, frankly, Captain, in our present circumstances, I see little use for such data here. Perhaps you can make use of biological information elsewhere. What else can I tell you? What aspect of history, Captain? Which group of aliens? Oh my god. Okay. In which race? The Shofixti are a race of intelligent marsupials who had been civilized for only a few decades when the war began. They were discovered in the Delta Gorno star system by the Yehat, who adopted and then uplifted the show. Do you have enough background information? Yeah. Okay, so am I gonna encounter all these? Ra so I have a question. Should I go through these conversations right now for the story, or should I deliberately wait a bit? Like, what do you think? Because, like, am I gonna encounter the all these people anyway, or are these just from the previous Star Control game? I think those what other group of are all in the game, Would you but like I it? mean, I don't think you sure. need the information right now. We can modify. What? Can you be more specific? If you have the patience, I would recommend you spend several months or even a year gathering mineral resources. You can find such minerals on almost any planet surface, but the quality and density will vary depending upon the type of planet you're on. Base metals are probably the most common materials you'll find, but they aren't particularly valuable. You can find rarer precious and radioactive elements on metal-rich worlds such as Mercury. An old miner once told me that you could tell the relative quality of a planet's minerals based on the planet's color as seen from space. Remember the color sequence from good to bad? The miner had a mnemonic that went something like, very young orangutan could grow bananas perhaps rather well. It is also the case that mineral yields will be better at hotter stars. Temperature is related to the size and color of a star. Red stars are the coolest, then orange, yellow, green, blue, and the hottest stars are white. That all depends on whom you meet, doesn't it, Captain? Well, in all seriousness, if you encounter the Ilrath, Bucks, Androsynth, or other hierarchy battle thralls, I wouldn't hold out much hope for a peaceful encounter. So if you feel you have the advantage, attack. The resources you will scavenge from the enemy's wreckage are well worth the effort. If you can find alliance races who are in a position to help us, then you must convince them to join with us. Their assistance may be crucial to our success. Hmm, let's see. You need to build up and balance the strength of your flagship. I would add thrusters up to, say, five or six. Speed is essential in combat, but it would also pay off over the long haul in hyperspace. And if you prefer to avoid confrontation, nothing beats a great pair of legs. I would add turning jets for increased maneuverability. I would add enough weapons to defend yourself if you're caught without escort ships. You need more crew, at least 50 to make productive voyages into space. You need additional fuel, at least 50 units. Build more landers. Your weapons will be underpowered in combat if you don't have at least one dynamo. I guess I'd gather more minerals to build up a good supply of resource units. 
Captain, I wish I had an easy answer, but I don't. The only way I can see of liberating Earth as well as the Alliance allies is to destroy the Urquan and their armada of battle thralls entirely. To defeat our enemies, we will need awesome strength, both in your flagship and the fleet, as well as the assistance of powerful new allies. Though combat will be unavoidable and sometimes necessary to achieve our goals, I'm certain your wits will be at least as important as your weapon. You'll need to explore this region of space, gathering resources and information wherever you go. I don't know, Captain, but I suspect their battle thralls know more than we do, so I suggest you try to gather information from them, perhaps by force. At first, your ship will be far too vulnerable to permit frontal assault on the Urquan. Even when your ship is at full power, we're faced with the reality that the hierarchy has thousands of ships. You cannot win the fight alone, Captain. You need allies. Also, towards the end of the war, when the hierarchy broke through the Corward Front, we heard rumors that the Urquan had unleashed some kind of super weapon which was unstoppable by normal means. You need to find out if that rumor was true, Captain, because if the Urquan do have such a weapon, we'll have to find some way to stop it or all our efforts are for naught. If you encounter an unknown alien race, proceed carefully and diplomatically. We need all the friends we can get, and we certainly can't afford any more enemies. Remember, Captain, with your precursor starship, you hold awesome power. But there will be situations when dealing with an alien race where a carrot will serve better than a stick. But first, you must determine what carrot the alien wants. You need to accumulate enough resources so we can build up your flagship and assemble a strong fleet. I'd also recommend that you acquire blueprints for other, more powerful ships than our trusty cruiser. I suspect that aliens will not give you such prints unless you form an alliance with them. What else can we discuss? What else can I tell you? What aspect of history, Captain? We have some data on this subject. What do you want to know about? Well, you probably know more about them than I do, but here goes. About 200,000 years ago, when our great to the nth grandparents were just starting to play with stone knives and bearskins, a star-faring species suddenly appeared on the galactic scene and spread like wildfire. We found evidence of their presence just about everywhere, from an orbital platform on Alpha Centauri to a stack of data plates in a cave on Pluto to some nameless widget found in a voodoo shop in New Orleans. But we never found a precursor <laughs> body or even a picture of one. We can conjecture what they look like by examining the scale and layout of their equipment. Such an analysis indicates they were giants, say five to eight meters tall and twice as wide. I don't know if they looked more like a brontosaur or an elephant. Anyway, about 3,000 years after the precursors made their dramatic appearance, they vanished. Poof! As far as we can tell, it took less than a decade to happen. You mean besides the precursors? Well, the only information we have is secondhand based on some research by a Chenzesu historian that I read at the Academy. Zed Sertzak, the historian, found some evidence that there was a group of alien races who formed an interstellar empire not too far from here about 22,000 years ago. The only species in this empire actually lived in our region of space was a race of rock-like creatures who lived in the Volpecule constellation. The presence of the hostile androsynth in that part of space severely limited Zed Sertzak's research. He never even found out the race's name. Yes, there is. Aside from the precursor relics we have found on Earth, often in museums mislabeled as modern art, we've discovered disturbing evidence of much more recent visitation. Perhaps you're already aware that during the mid to late 20th century, there were unaccountable UFO sightings as well as dozens of reported encounters with alien life forms. Although we can discount many of the reports as wishful fabrication or traumatic translation, the military authorities of the time kept a secret record of the incidents which were legitimate. In each such case, the aliens are almost identical in appearance. They have white skin and minimal facial features except for huge almond-shaped eyes which are often described as glowing or luminescent. This description fits almost perfectly the Arilu Lolly Lay. 
In most of the legitimate encounters, the people involved describe being physically examined or modified by the alien. In some cases, unusual pregnancies occurred, and in almost every instance, there were repeat visitations as though the Ari Lulalile were doing checkups on their subject. We never got the chance to confront the Ari Lulalile about what they did to us and why. I wonder if we ever will. Would you like information on any other aspect of history? What about the war? Earth got involved late in the game in 2112 when the Chenjesu arrived in our solar system for the first time. So let's back up a few years to 2098 when the Chenjesu super sensitive receivers detected a strange signal from the Ophiuchi constellation. Though even the Chenjesu didn't know it, it was the first sign of the Urquan's arrival. The Urquan, having detected the presence of many sentient species, were beaming out an exulting hunting cry. The first direct evidence of the Urquan's intent was the sudden conquest of the Umga, a solitary though not unfriendly species in the Orionis constellation. Jinjesu, distraught by the invasion, were further angered when the Urquan turned their fleets on the hostile but weak Ilrath race. A hastily assembled defense force of Myrna Herman Shenjesu vessels turned the Urquan fleet aside, but the invader moved into spathy space, rapidly subjugating that race. With each new conquest, the Urquan fleet grew larger as it added slave vessels to its ranks. Earth joined the Shenjesu to form the Alliance of Free Stars at about the same time as the Androsynth stars fell to the Urquan Armada. Before the ink was dry on our agreement with the Chenjesu in 2116, a new race appeared in orbit around the moon and asked for admittance to the Alliance. It was the Arilu Lalile. The timing seemed unusual and the Arilu were definitely weird, looking like saucer men from Mars, but we were too busy cranking up our mothballed heavy industry that we really didn't pay it much attention at the time. At the start of the war, here on Earth, we were working like crazy, churning out hundreds of heavy cruisers and smaller support vehicles. The Urquan were busy, too. Unbeknownst to us, they had moved down towards the Luton Star Group and were attacking the Vux, who only the Yehot knew existed. Our botched first contact with the Vux took place in 2119, and it was the biggest single mistake we made during the war. After defeating the Bucks, the Urquan fleet ran smack into the combined might of the Ahot and Show 60, supported by the first wave of our cruisers. Again, the Urquan turned away from the hard spot to attack the weak, though we just thought they were running away. In fact, the Urquan had found another independent alien race, the Mykon, in the Brahi constellation. The Mykon's voluntary submission to the Urquan brought the return of the Urquan fleets, now swollen with a hundred devastating Mykon pod ships. The last entrance to the conflict were the Sirene, a race of space gypsies who had escaped the hierarchy by moving their vast fleet of slow-moving habitats into human space. With the side set, the last Urquan offensive began. The Urquan came roaring through Vuck space and tried to push past the Indian Mira star systems. Their onslaught was barely repulsed and our counterattack made hardly a dent in the hierarchy forces, but we held the line. The Corward Front remained intact. Over the following 10 years, there were many great battles between the combined Alliance Starfleet and the Urquan and their hierarchy of battle thralls. Then in 2134, a dramatic shift in the balance of power took place. This must have been about the time the science research mission was sent to the planet of Vela. Our fleets were pushed back from the Indy Mira line beyond Raynet. Holding Rigel caused grievously in Chenjesu forces, and the Urquan, recognizing this weakness, shifted to focus the brunt of their forces on Procyon. That was the last we heard from the Chenjesu and the Murnerher. A few weeks later, waves of ships hit us from all directions. When Ceres Station, our outpost on the asteroid belt, fell to the hierarchy, we knew we were beaten, but we fought on anyway. Three days later, the Urquan vaporized our last remaining laser forts on the moon, and the dreadnoughts took up geosynchronous position above Rome, Moscow, Beijing, Tokyo, London, Buenos Aires, and Washington. We'd lost the war, and we knew it. But the Urquan decided to make it real clear. And that's why if you check any of our most recent maps, you won't find Buenos Aires. After the UN submitted their formal surrender, we were given a week to decide the nature of our servitude. The Urquan demanded that the decision be made through popular vote. When all the votes were tallied, Earth had chosen not to fight for the Urquan. We had become a fallow slave world. 
We were given a month to withdraw all of our people and equipment to Earth. Anyone or anything left off planet would be destroyed after the shield went up. Then the Urquan broadcast an odd message. All objects of human construction more than 500 years old were to be abandoned. We didn't know what the Urquan meant until they moved their dreadnoughts into new orbital positions and opened fire on the surface with their fusion weapons. In seconds, large sections of London, Paris, and other European cities were incinerated. At first, we thought they were going to annihilate us after all. And we noticed they were also striking such targets as the Giza pyramids, the Parthenon in Athens, and Stonehenge. Curiously, the United States was almost untouched. The flaming rain lasted 40 hellish hours. It took days after we crawled from our smoldering shelters to realize what the Urquan had done. Our new masters had targeted every building, monument, or other man-made construction older than 500 years and destroyed it. In those two days, we lost most of the history of mankind. In some cases, the Urquan destroyed places we did not even suspect were significant. From their positions in orbit, the dreadnoughts blew away a kilometer of land in central Iraq, vaporized several targets in the Amazon rainforest, punched a big hole through the Antarctic ice cap to destroy something deep under the surface, and melted a broad swath of the ocean floor in the southeastern Atlantic. Then, just a couple of days later, the shield went up, and our contact with the outside world stopped. The next time I saw the stars was eight years ago, when I was transferred up here to be the new commander of this star base. Would you like any information on any other aspect of history? Which group of aliens? Okay, which race? Genjasu were leaders of the Alliance, even though they refused to accept formally the title. I don't know if their silicon-based biology is just plain superior to our old carbon models, or if their fantastic intellect were the product of an ancient, peaceful culture. Whatever the reason, I'd rather be taking orders from a Chenzesu than any other life form, absolutely. One of the more amazing things about them was they never used hyperwave communicators. They could send messages naturally, and their natural hyperwave receptors were much more sensitive than even our best units. We didn't really get much of a chance to learn about those mechanical beings, but I'll tell you what I know. They're the product of a distant, unknown culture who sent a giant factory arc into our region of space many centuries ago. The mother arc, that's what the Earth press called it, turned out millions of robots and finally broke down. I don't know why the Myrnaherm didn't repair the mother arc. Maybe they can't. My personal guess as to why they were sent here is that they're on the leading edge of a colonization project. And once the Myrnaherm have tamed enough new worlds, the genuine colonists, whoever they are, will arrive and claim their due. I'd like to think I'm not a bigoted person, Captain, especially when it comes to allies, but there's just something about those Arilu that gives me the creeps. One thing I'll say for them, though, they possess some technique for moving really fast through hyperspace. They never let us know what it was, but it sure beats the pants off our fastest ships. Most raw recruits saw the siren as nothing more than uh, warm, breathing pinups. Warm they are, and yes, they do breathe most magnificently, but Captain, they are far more than simple joy units. The history shows the Cyrene established and maintained a peaceful culture from their Bronze Age through their discovery of starflight. Before their planet was destroyed in a horrible cataclysm, their world was in Eden. The Shofixti are a race of intelligent marsupials who had been civilized for only a few decades when the war began. They were discovered in the Delta Gorno star system by the Yehat, who adopted and then uplifted the Shofixti, giving them advanced technology and cultural definition. Shofixti are noble and fearless warriors, Captain. In addition, their incredible fecundity and rapid maturation rate kept Alliance ranks solid even at the worst part of the war. You know, I once flew as an observer aboard one of their ships on routine patrol. We never saw the enemy, but I could never stop thinking about the glory device it had strapped to the bottom of its hull. The Yehat are a race of ancient warrior clans that have been traveling the stars for many centuries. Clans are highly competitive and sometimes even wage war on each other, but the clans are all loyal to the queen and her royal family, known as the Veepzeeps. The Veepzeeps have been in power for over 2,000 years. 
and it is said that during their rule, the Yehat never lost a battle. What other group of aliens are you interested in? Which species? Imagine facing a cowardly, mobile clam armed with a howitzer, and you've got a good idea of what it's like dealing with a spaffy. Although they tend to avoid battles as much as their masters will allow, once in battle, a spaffy eluder is one tough cookie. I once heard a rumor, though I don't like to believe in it myself, that a rogue band of courageous spaffy broke away from the main star fleet painted their ships black with bright red stripes and formed the Black Spathy Squadron, dedicated to performing brave and hostile deeds. Like I said, I'd have to see it to believe it. The Mycons are hard to get a handle on. In fact, I'm not sure any human has ever had a real conversation with a Mycon. What we know of them, we've learned from their corpses, which I may add have a nasty habit of coming back to life when thawed out from a decompression quick freeze. Mycon ships seem to expend a significant amount of energy on life support. This is probably because the Mycon only thrive in temperatures close to the melting point of lead. As far as we know, the Mycon are the only race to actively seek out the Urquan in order to become combat slaves. It's unfortunate that the Umga fell to the Urquan so early in the war because I suspect we would have gotten along well with those big blob creatures. At the very least, it would have been entertaining. We know them a bit better than most races because they were eager to talk with our ships before, after, and during battle. The Arilu intimated that they had a relationship with the Umga before the Urquan arrived, but I don't know any detail. When I was flying combat missions along the Corward front, there was nothing we feared more than the Andraseth Hit and Run Squadron. Their blazer ships were more than a match for our cruisers, so we stayed clear of Ada Volpeculae, their home star. In addition, I think each of us aboard the ship knew deep down in our hearts that the Andrasith had a damn good reason for hating us. Our grandparents had kept them as slaves for nearly 50 years. I still have nightmares about those spiders taking me prisoner, using me as one of their six sacrifices to Dogar and Kazon, their twin gods of destruction and torment. Those guys were almost as scary as the Andrasith to those of us in Deep Space Patrol. Their Avenger ships could appear out of nowhere and melt a cruiser down to slag in seconds. Luckily for us, the bulk of the Ilrath fleet was thrown against the Chenjesu and the Murnaher. The Starship Far Voyager under the command of Captain Jeffrey L. Rand encountered the Vux near Beta Mira. Although the details are hazy, it's generally accepted that Rand offended the Vux Starship commander with an inadvertent insult. What other group of aliens are you interested in? None that we had made formal contact with. The Chen Jesu implied that they had met two other star-faring species, one near the Gikla's constellation and the other directly coreward from Procyon. The Arilu Lalile once mentioned having some fun with an alien race in Draconis, but like so much else with the Arilu, they never revealed the whole story. I'm sure there are hundreds more alien races in our galaxy, but beyond what I've told you, your guess is as good as mine. Would you like information on any other aspect of history? Sure. Anything else? Fine. Is there anything else you need? The more minerals you bring us, Captain, the faster we'll be able to tackle the Urquan. We shall await your return, Captain. Yes, Captain? Try to avoid getting...
Demas, are you live here? I guess you're not, probably. Um, I'm here. Oh, you are. Nice. I don't know, dude. I'm really liking this game, actually. There's, um, I can already tell, like, there's so... This is like, um... This is like one of those games where... There's a lot of... There's a lot of... You know, I feel like this game is exemplified by that menu, right? When you when you went into like, please tell me about the aliens. Okay, which aliens? The ones in the alliance? Oh yeah, the ones in the alliance. And then there's like ten of them, right? Where it's like, mm -hmm. oh my fucking god, I have to listen to this for half an hour, right? Um, but but you know, it it is appreciated, right? That like they bothered to put all that stuff in, right? Um, and it's the same thing now. I'm looking at the ship screen, and it's like, oh yeah, this is like. You know, it's like a fucking... It's like 30 slots here, dude. Yeah. I mean, that, that's great. <laughs> and I also... I, I love the fact that you're... I love the fact that you're, um... A, as weird as it is to say, this game does a lot of realism stuff very, very correct. Where, like, your, um... Your flagship is, like, way bigger than, like, your smaller ships or whatever. Um... And like, you know, you're, you get like these escort ships and then you have your, your main ship is like a logistic ship, you know? Trying to navigate this menu and figure out how it works. I guess the top thing is just a side wave view. Hey my dudes. Hi Space. I'm back. For real. Um, actually, to the miracle of... Of OBS, we can just cut the stream here and start again later. 